Hey gang, Lisa here from Call That Girl with another YouTube video for you. Today's video is going to be pieced out a little bit and maybe in certain pieces, and it might be long. I'm going to try to go into some detail, but today's video is how to do an Office 365 migration manually. Uh, a lot of folks, especially in the MSP world, like doing it through uh, using like Migration Wiz and some tools and such, and that works out fine. But I've always come from the school of doing it manually because I have clients that have like just one mailbox or five. And to me, a lot of them have like third party apps and they have pop accounts and there's a lot of confusing, you know, additions that I have to do. So I've just kind of always learned how to do it manually. And just recently I've been doing the migration whiz, which is awesome, but it's not for every client. And if you're working with very small companies like micro sized businesses, well, manually sometimes better. So what am I doing in this video is I'm actually doing a migration right now with a client. And um, first thing I noticed was I already had to fix something in our Outlook before I could start the migration. And that got me thinking, maybe I should do a video. So for those that are watching the video, I'm going to go through without even taking notes and writing down notes, what I do. And if you want detailed step-by-step -step on how to do some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, I do sell an ebook and it has like 24 pages, step-by-step, -step, how to do every single thing, and it's a really good little book. It's called Call That Girl's Guide to Microsoft Exchange Migrations. But now this video should be good enough for those that are technical enough and just want to kind of figure it out themselves. Um, with Office 365 now becoming like the big thing, with uh, Microsoft buying LinkedIn, there's going to be a lot of Office 365 work out there, folks, a lot of it. So anyway, let's get started here. So if I'm not looking at the monitor and stuff, it's because I'm doing other things. But uh, one second for your email. I'm actually remoted into a few computers right now. So anyway, first thing you want to do is when you uh, land your first Office 365 sale is you want to procure the sale. There's a few ways you can do it. Is you can uh, first, you can um, work directly with Microsoft and become a reseller or just have the client buy it. I personally don't, I don't know, I don't like working with Microsoft directly. I prefer using a vendor. So the vendor I use is AppRiver, AppRiver.com. Uh, I'll put a link in there if you want to contact a sales rep and become a reseller or a partner because I just like having a backup company for me because I'm a solo independent and if, um, and if, I have them to back me up it just makes me feel more comfortable than calling some random person at Microsoft and not having the relationship because my migration work is pretty detailed and I need help sometimes. <laughs> I'm the only one at my company. Okay, so what I would do is I go into my portal at App River and put in the sale from the client, but prior to that, I have the client fill out a form. So if you buy the ebook, you'll get access to the form. But the form asks all the questions you need to do um, to do the migration and have the information you need for that person and their employees. I have one for employees also. So you get the secured information about the domain and the DNS settings and the control panel with the forms and all the passwords and all the account information. So that's actually the first thing I do is have them do the form. Then I go put in the sale with App River. And then after App River sends me the, um, they get the sale, they send me um, like a verification that you have to take a little text record uh, update and put it into the DNS control panel for the client. And it's just like a little, hello, we know you exist, kind of verification for Microsoft. Once that's done, then AppRiver sells me an email, or excuse me, sends me an email that says your information's on its way and then sends me the credentials for the Microsoft account. After that, I usually have the uh, settings set up to start so I can do the migration work. Now, before you actually do the migration work in a client's Outlook, there's a couple things you want to do, which number one is you want to make sure in Outlook, <laughs> this is what happened with this client I was working on, is Outlook sometimes by default doesn't have all the email on Outlook that's on the server. So you want to go into the account settings, the email settings, make sure the slider is slid over in Outlook so it has all mail in Outlook because what we're going to be doing is exporting out uh, all the email to a PST file locally on the computer. 
So instead of using the migration whiz, which is all online, you're doing it on the local computer. Oop, just a second, got a client chatting with me here. Okay, dope. Okay, so anyway, um, like this client, like I said, they have, uh, they had half their mail, so now I had to go and download it, so that kind of prevented the migration from continuing, because now I have to go get that mail, and that kind of sucked. But that's the thing, when you do a manual one, you don't always have time to do the prep work to know what's sometimes hidden on the computer. So anyway, once that is all 100% downloaded, then I can do an export. Now, if you're doing an exchange to exchange migration, you just need to export out the whole exchange to a PST file. That should get all the notes, calendars, contacts, all that stuff. If they're on POP or IMAP, well, let's start with POP. If they're on POP, the PST is already on Outlook, so you shouldn't have to you know, make an export of that. But sometimes it's nice to just export it anyway as a backup because you never know what can happen. And then if you have to create a new profile, uh, you can import that in quickly or if you need to import it into the same profile, it's not attached so it'll let you do it. IMAP, on the other hand, is kind of tricky. IMAP can have some bugs to it. Um, first thing is IMAP has a filter applied sometimes at the bottom of Outlook. I have a video out for that on YouTube as well, how to lift that and do that. But you gotta make sure all the mail is out of the filters and you wanna make sure that there's not like thousands of folders because some people have thousands of folders and you definitely wanna use my trick from the YouTube video for that. Uh, before, Also, before I get going with any migration, I always right click on the mailbox to make sure I see the size and it matches the export. Just to make sure you're doing it right. Okay, now hold on. Yes. Okay, doke. So then, let me see where I was at. Remember, I'm doing this unscripted from memory. <laughs> okay, so you export out. Oh, here's what I was saying is about the pop and the IMAP. Those do not export out the calendar and contacts. So you do need to export those out as well manually. And uh, notes tasks, reminders, you know, all that stuff, you have, to ex you have to export that out too. So what I do is I just name it export the date and the name of the folder. And sometimes people have multiple calendars, they've got calendars on Gmail, they have iCloud, and they've got Companion Link or Deja Office or G-Sync It, they've got third-party apps. So just keep in mind, if you're doing a migration with those, exporting iCloud sometimes is not so easy you have to go up to the top and save the calendar. You just can't export. So iCloud, you can actually. It's uh, Outlook.com. You have to actually save the calendar as an ICS. Okay. So then, once you get everything backed up, then you have to go into the Microsoft account, create the email accounts, which sometimes you can do prior to the migration. Create the email accounts, get those set up, give them a password that they want or that you want to give them. Then you go get the domain settings out of the Office 365. Once you get those, then you can go into the DNS control panel for the client and update the MX and the CNAME record. Uh, sometimes those can be tricky. Sometimes. Uh, so the, some, of these, uh, some of these website companies, these web hosting companies and domain companies, they have really funky DNS control panels and they make you Kind of learn as you go, I'll be honest. I've had some that have pulled my hair out a few times and it's really confusing. But uh, generally, if you talk to their support people, they'll help you through it um, and get those updated. Once uh, you get those updated, you wanna log into the online Office 365, test a, an email back and forth to make sure that it, um, the new mail is coming in. And after you see that the new mail is coming in, now, sometimes there could be a delay, too, just to let you know. Like, some companies, the, the cheaper ones, don't have instant updates. Now, they all say it could take 24 to 72 hours, which I've never seen. But some do take four hours. So you want to make sure you tell your clients, well, it could take four hours, and it has. But some companies, or most companies, are just instant. So I like that. So once you see email delivering to the online office 365, then you can go into the client's outlook. Now I'll tell you these tricks. 
Outlook 2010, you cannot have two exchange accounts in that, so you're gonna have to make, create a new profile no matter what. Outlook 2010 used to be my favorite and now it's not becoming my favorite. <laughs> if you have a client with a lot of stuff going on in a new profile, it's gonna be a rework of a whole profile. And this would happen even if you used Migration Wiz, to be honest with you, you have to rework their Outlook for them. So, uh, let's see, so I would probably, uh, with 2010, make a new profile. 2013, you should not have to. There is sometimes a little error that comes up that says you cannot remove an exchange account because it was the primary. Well, that's the one that's kind of hard coded in with Outlook in that profile, and you do have to create a new profile. Which create a new profile is not a big deal as long as you know how to do the aftercare and fine tuning that the clients are going to want because they will want it. Okay, so once you get the new account set up, then you can start importing in the data. If they had an exchange to exchange, you just import the, the exchange account. If they had calendar and contacts from a third party app or just on the, this computer only, do those first. Do those first because those get synced up quicker than the email. And then once you start importing the email, uh, you can't do anything else in Outlook until that's done. Until you stop seeing it move, and then after it's even in Outlook, it has to synchronize with the server. Okay, so then it has to upload. And that could take a long time. If you have a lot of mail and uh, slow internet, expect a really long synchronization, okay? But um, if they don't have a lot of mail and they have fast internet, it can be really quick. So then after I get that import started, remember contacts calendar first and then the mail, uh, if the client has a phone, go set up the phone and get that done. And the phone, uh, if it's iPhone, it usually connects real nicely. I've got instructions also on how to set up the iPhone. If they have Android, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Android's not my favorite to set up, but it does work. It's just, there's so many different versions of Androids. It's hard to have one consistent, um, one consistent um, instruction sheet because their different versions don't match. So once the phone's done, then the mail will start coming down to the phone as the Outlook is syncing up to the server. Then, oop, I got a call here, hold on. So then, um, once the Outlook is syncing on the one computer, sorry, I don't wanna shut off my phone, that one is gone. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, so then, um, if they have another computer, you can go ahead and set up the new exchange on the other computer and as one is syncing up to the cloud the other one will be bringing it down so i try to tell people right now your outlooks are kind of in surgery mode you know it's figuring itself out and then once those are done then comes the fine tuning people generally want their address book to show up they want their auto complete there they uh, i usually give them an optimization of their outlook too um, just the little things, their views might be different, their stuff might be changed, their this and that, their signatures. There's quite a little list of things that people want in Outlook. <laughs> so if you're doing it, make sure you know how to do it. And if you're not comfortable doing it, I'm always available for coaching. Or if you want to hire me to do the job, whatever. Either way works for me. Uh, that's kind of it then after that. That is like, I don't know how long this video is so far, not very long. But the point is, is that that's it in a nutshell. What I, just dis, what I just told you can take hours and hours and hours to do though, because there's technical challenges with Outlook sometimes. My favorite is, you don't, you know, that's why you do the form is you find out what Outlook versions they have, but sometimes they don't know and they just pick the top one and they have really old Outlook or I don't know. So anyway, it does, uh, you always can have a challenge. There can be, you know, when you're doing remote jobs, you could remote in, they could have a virus. They could have a broken Outlook. They could have a thousand folders. They could have 20 gigs of email. It, it helps to do the form to kind of know, but sometimes you just never know until you get in the computer. And like I said, right now I'm doing a migration. And let me look at the client, how long ago I did it. I started it an hour ago, and it's still updating from the server. Yeah. So I think I'll close the video, though, with just telling you folks a few things. Um, this is a fair assessment. Is that a lot of times clients don't know what the DNS control panel information is. You goose chase for that. Um, you can go to MX Toolbox and go look and try to figure it out, but sometimes you can't tell. 
Uh, you also want to make sure when you do Gmail conversions over that the filters applied is super important. And if you can go log into their Gmail and see how much mail they actually have on the server. So a lot of times they don't have the same in their Outlook. <laughs> I found that out this morning with my migration. So, well actually with the client I was working on before that. Um, so there's lots of little things I, uh, I learned sometimes with each migration. I pick up uh, technology changes, Office 365 changes, the control panel with that changes all the time. The, if you have a GoDaddy client, you cannot really see the exchange control panel. They hide that from you, which completely sucks. Because a lot of the work I do is in the control panel of the exchange I need. Um, if you use vendors like AppRiver, you can totally see everything. So if you're a technician out there looking for a good partner, I said AppRiver is my recommendation. And um, anyway, I think that's it, gang. I'm gonna close up this video. If you wanna check out my, uh, check out my ebook, it's the migration ebook. I also sell five other ebooks that are just kind of handy for technicians and for people. If you are an end user watching this and think you can do this yourself, please don't. Please don't do that. Let a technician do it. Uh, me or another tech or somebody that knows the little nuances of Outlook and what can happen because I've had some clients really mess up stuff and uh, if you call a company and they say, oh, we're going to do all your migration for you and everything for free, be leery because free gets you free. Free is cheap and you only get really half your migration and sometimes you have to wait days and days and days for your mail because it's going through the cloud and I like doing it manually just to get it all done and downloaded. All right, that's it. That's a long video, folks. Uh, if you want my help, you can call me at 612-865-4475. You can email me, lisa at callthatgirl.biz, and check down below to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And there's notes down below for the book and such. Thanks. Talk to you soon.